Good morning, and thank you for joining today's session, Understanding the Problem, Crafting the Right Response. My name is Dr. Ben Miller, and I'm the Chief Strategy Officer for Wellbeing Trust. We're a national foundation focused on advancing the mental, social, and spiritual health of the nation. It's my great honor to be able to serve as today's moderator on the first of five sessions we're gonna have on mental health. And major thanks to our partners who helped with these five sessions, Kennedy Forum, Inseparable, American Psychological Association, the National Alliance on Mental Illness, and the Education Development Center. Each of these five sessions have been carefully curated to bring the best thought leaders and national experts to the table to discuss concrete ways we can address our nation's mental health and addiction crisis. And as the data show, which we'll discuss today, we've been in quite the crisis both this past year during COVID for sure, but also before the virus was even a thought in our minds. From increases in depression, anxiety, drug overdose to just overall stress, this pandemic has brought mental health to the forefront of all of our lives. We may not have understood the concept of mental health before COVID, but now it's become very real to all of us. And this is a gentle reminder that prior to the pandemic, we weren't doing so great with our nation's mental health. We had room for improvement. We were losing more lives to preventable causes than ever before. Deaths to drug, alcohol, and suicide had shown market increases since 1999, lowering life expectancy, forever changing families and communities. And these issues impact all generations, all ethnic and minority groups, though at differing degrees of severity with many of the mental health disparities uh, mirroring the physical health disparities that we've seen. And while our culture has become more open to talking about mental health, there remains a stigma attached to it that is less and less social, but more entrenched structurally. In the face of these seemingly insurmountable and daunting problems, we have to have hope, a vision for what could be, a drive for how to get it done. And that brings us to today, to this webinar series and to you. Over the next five weeks, we're gonna offer sessions on ways that we can better address mental health and addiction in our country. Today lays the groundwork for future sessions, a guide of sorts for ways that we can better see the importance of comprehensively bringing mental health into the fabric of our redesign. So let's get going. Let me start with brief introductions for our experts and then hear from um, some of our members of Congress who in cooperation with we have joined us for today's session. I'll begin with Ms. Colleen Carr, who's the director of the National Action Alliance for Suicide Prevention, or the Action Alliance, as we just shortened and say. Um, the Action Alliance is the nation's public-private partnership for suicide prevention and is tasked with coordinating a comprehensive national suicide prevention response in the United States and works with over 250 partner organizations to coordinate and implement the national strategy for suicide prevention. So thank you so much for being here, Colleen. Next, we have Congressman Patrick Kennedy, who spent over 16 years in the U.S. House of Representatives serving Rhode Island's first congressional district. Patrick has done more on mental health than will ever be written down. His fingerprints are on every major piece of reform, including as a lead sponsor for the landmark Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act, or the federal parity law. He's the founder of the Kennedy Forum and just an absolute true champion for mental health. And finally, we have Dr. Josh Gordon, who is the director of the National Institute of Mental Health. Uh, the lead federal agency for research on mental disorders. Uh, Dr. Gordon oversees an extensive research portfolio of basic and clinical research that seeks to transform the understanding and treatment of mental illnesses, paving the way for prevention, recovery, and cure. He also has the distinguished honor of being extremely talented at translating complex research into language that everyone can understand. And if you want to question me on this, ask him about his dissertation or some of the other articles he's published because uh, it's a fun one. So thank you for being here today. We wanna to thank especially Senator Stabino, uh, Congressman Katko and Congressman Napolitano for their support in pushing for mental health reform in Congress and for coordinating with us today. So we, we will hear from first uh, Congressman Napolitano. Uh, she has recorded a video for us. Uh, she is unable to attend, but we will um, turn to that video now, Alicia. Congresswoman Doris Napolitano. Thank you for inviting me to participate in today's discussion. I proudly represent California's 32nd District and I also co-chair the Mental Health Caucus with my good friend John Ketko. Currently, the caucus has 99 bipartisan members and works to educate members and their staff on this critical topic. Thank you, Dr. Joshua Gordon, Director of National Institute of Mental Health and former Congressman Patrick Kennedy for joining the discussion today. It is important that we work together to address mental health and suicide prevention during this pandemic, which has only worsened an already existing crisis. While we have started to get traction and recognition that mental health is a critical component of good health, more work is needed. I am glad to see the national response includes a call to action 
to the following things. Change the conversation about mental health. Ensure the equitability of comprehensive services and invest in prevention and early intervention approaches, specifically in our schools. One issue I would like to point out is the toll this pandemic has placed on our children. It is critical that we provide schools the resources to create a mental health plan to help their students during this stressful time. I know this for hand from my decades of local involvement. In 2001, after learning one in three Latino adolescents have contemplated suicide, I secured half a million dollars in federal funding from SAMHSA for a pilot program in Los Angeles County. Schools were very resistant at first because of the stigma, but the program has now grown to 35 schools thanks to the Los Angeles County Mental Health. We knew that if we started early with children, we could help them succeed and save lives. It serves as a model for HR 721, the Mental Health Services for Students Act, which would provide funding for school-based programs nationwide. The bill passed the House last Congress, and we hold close to the House floor again soon. Our work continues, but it cannot, and it must not, be limited to Congress. So I encourage all of you to get involved, continue to educate all your elected officials on this important topic, and share your knowledge with friends and family. If you see somebody who has fallen on hard times, talk with them, help them out, and refer them to mental health services. The National Suicide Prevention Lifeline is 800-273-TALK-8255. Together, we can strengthen the mental well-being of all our communities and eventually live in a world where there is reduced stigma or no stigma. Thank you very much and God bless. Thank you, Congresswoman, for those kind opening remarks. Uh, Congressman Katko, her co-chair for the Mental Health Caucus, will be joining us here in just a moment. Uh, we'll go to him when he, when he does jump on. But to get us started here, I'd like to be able to turn it over to Congressman Kennedy and Dr. Gordon for their opening remarks on today's session. Gentlemen. Thank you, Ben. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to join you. And thank you to National Action Alliance on Suicide Prevention for all their work and then deciding to convene this group and uh, for Dr. Gordon's leadership. Um, as we all have already said, you know, COVID uh, marks a, an enormous milestone in the struggle to achieve mental health for all Americans. We already were in a mental health crisis, but COVID has just added fuel to the fire. Um, the challenge that we have today is to try to bring to scale those interventions, those evidence-based interventions that NIMH and SAMHSA and others have spent years researching and which we have, but have yet to deploy because in fact, we've never really reimbursed for mental health and addiction care in the same way that we have the rest of medicine. That's left us with a huge gap in available providers and, and services. And that's a gap that we have to make up for. I applaud Congress for their passing billions of dollars for mental health in this recent America's Recovery Act. But that's just a beginning. Uh, frankly, we need to continue to push for expansion of the ACA. We need to continue to push for implementation of the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act. Uh, we need the new Secretary of Labor to, to really enforce uh, the improvements to the parity law, which require um, insurance companies to really uh, detail their medical management practices uh, uh, much more uh, deliberately and intentionally and specifically, so as to really hold uh, payers accountable. And why is this? Because we know that uh, if you're seeking mental health and addiction care, you're much more likely to face out-of-network uh, costs just because of the lack of available in-network uh, care. Uh, that leads to six times more likely to go out of network, paying more out of pocket as a result. If you're a child, you're 10 times more likely to go out of network to see a mental health professional. These are systemic um, challenges that we have as a nation. They're not gonna be solved overnight, but I'm so pleased uh, that along with Dr. Gordon and this uh, committee for the national response, uh, that we have detailed a, a thorough outline of a plan of action, among other things, to, to fully implement the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act. 
And to really enforce uh, not only that, but the kind of opportunities for payment reform that we'll see through CMS reform, in investing in collaborative care so we can really leverage the existing medical uh, and healthcare system to do more mental health as opposed to just relegating it simply to uh, those with a specialty in mental health. We need everybody. We need all hands on deck to help us solve this challenge. And uh, this plan that we're going to be speaking about today helps us to achieve that. And now it's a, a great pr privilege and, uh, to turn it over to Dr. Uh, Gordon and thank him for his uh, leadership at the National Institutes of Mental Health and particularly his leadership on this commission. Thanks, uh, Representative Kennedy and uh, uh, Ben and, and Colleen for joining us today. Uh, and thank you all for attending uh, this this webinar and, and for making a commitment to attend the, the, the series that, we, that we're embarking on. By way of introduction, I'll just add to what Ben said that the National Institute of Mental Health is one of 27 institutes and centers that make up the NIH. And our mission, as was mentioned, is uh, to transform the understanding and treatment of mental illness, paving the way for prevention, recovery, and cure. Our research portfolio is guided by a strategic plan for research, which outlines our research priorities. And a significant component of that plan is working to ensure that our research findings influence mental health care through changes in both practice and policy. And it's in that context that the NIMH is really pleased and proud to be able to join the National Action Alliance in this national response initiative that we'll be talking about today. It goes without saying that one fifth of Americans are bearing the burden of mental illness at any given point in time. And perhaps then it's not a coincidence that about one fifth of the House members are members of the Mental Health Caucus. This, uh, this burden though has likely been worsened by the pandemic as we'll discuss today and throughout the webinar. But perhaps more importantly, as, uh, as Representative Kennedy mentioned, it's, uh, it's really shown, shined, shown a light on uh, the issues in mental health, on the current crisis that preceded the pandemic, and the need to ensure that we have an appropriate uh, public health response and policy response uh, to, uh, to, these, uh, to this crisis. One a couple of notes on the national response. It's a diverse, nonpartisan public-private partnership. And, and, and we're committed to driving meaningful, lasting change in mental health and suicide prevention through collaboration, leadership, and action. And it's a response to the pandemic, but it is not meant to be limited uh, to the pandemic itself, but really to fundamentally change how we, uh, how we care for our, for our country from a mental health perspective. We're working to create sustainable and comprehensive solutions to the mental health impacts of the pandemic while also preparing to address future needs by mitigating risks and building resiliency. And as I'll talk about more, we know how to do this from a research perspective. And uh, as was mentioned by uh, already, the real issue is in implementing what we know. Nonetheless, research and collaboration are essential to address the impact of the pandemic. And, and that's what I hope to tell you about today. Thank you both for your opening comments and appreciate you both again for being here and your support for what we're gonna to discuss today. So Colleen, I'd love to turn to you. The, the National Action Alliance for Suicide Prevention is the leading public-private initiative which is aimed at preventing suicide. Um, you have been so instrumental through your leadership in starting mental health and suicide prevention, um, specifically around the national response for COVID-19. And as was mentioned, um, this is under the umbrella of the Action Alliance. Could you tell us a little bit about this effort in more detail and some of the priority areas? Sure, thank you, Ben, and thank you, Dr. Gordon and, and Congressman Kennedy for your leadership on the national response. And as you mentioned, the Action Alliance is the, the nation's public-private partnership for suicide prevention. Uh, we're housed at EDC, and we bring together senior leaders from government, business, and the nonprofit sector to align our efforts to implement the national strategy for suicide prevention and what we know to be effective best practices. And we recognized last spring as COVID-19 was starting to take hold that just as we needed a coordinated national response to the virus itself, we needed a coordinated response to the mental health impacts. And so we stood up the Mental Health and Suicide Prevention National Response to COVID-19, or what we call the National Response Now. Um, as, as you mentioned, led by Dr. Gordon and Congressman Kennedy alongside a distinguished group of steering committee members. 
And we knew very early on that what we really needed was a shared agenda across mental health and suicide. So we could really speak with one voice as a sector as to what is most needed at this time. And we now have that shared agenda with the National Responses Action Plan and related efforts like the CEO Huddle's Unified Vision. And what these efforts demonstrate is that now more than ever, there's alignment in our national priorities around mental health. And we have the opportunity to make significant changes in how we talk about, how we prevent, how we treat, and how we finance mental health and suicide prevention in our country. So I'm just gonna briefly outline what is in the action plan and I hope all of you have had a chance to review it um, and um, think about how what is in the action plan might inform the work that you are doing um, on, on a policy response to COVID-19. So in the action plan, we outline six priorities that really weave together a comprehensive approach to addressing mental health and suicide during COVID. Number one is changing the national uh, conversation about mental health and suicide. In a recent survey, the Action Alliance did half of respondents reported being more open to talking about mental health since COVID-19, and 81% said it's more important than ever to make suicide prevention a national priority. The second priority is increasing access to evidence-based treatments for substance use and mental health disorders in specialty and primary care. As been, has been mentioned, effective care models exist and we need to be implementing and paying for effective treatment for those that are seeking care. Priority three, we need to increase the use of non-punitive and supportive crisis intervention services through a comprehensive crisis response system that includes trained professionals to safely and compassionately respond to people in crisis. Priority four, we need to establish near real-time data collection systems to identify changes in rates of suicide, overdose, or other key events, and clusters and spikes in those outcomes. COVID has taught us just how important timely, accurate, and comprehensive data is to understand what's happening and to help leaders make informed decisions, and we need that same type of data in mental health and suicide. Priority five is ensuring the equitable delivery of comprehensive and effective suicide prevention and mental health services for Black Americans, Latinx Americans, American Indian, Alaska Native communities, LGBTQ individuals, and others disproportionately impacted by the pandemic. And we have to do more to address inequities in everything that we're doing to address mental health and suicide. And priority six is investing in prevention and early intervention approaches to treat the root causes of suicide and mental health problems in a range of settings, including schools, as uh, Representative Napolitano mentioned, places of employment and community spaces. And so these six priorities in the action plan lay out a comprehensive approach. And these priorities are things that were important before the pandemic. They're needed more than ever during the pandemic, but most importantly, will still be relevant and needed after the pandemic, which is why action and coordinated policy and practice change now is critical and is really at the heart of what the national response is looking to achieve. Thanks, Ben. Thank you, Colleen. And welcome, Congressman Kako. Thank you for joining us here. We're gonna come to you now. Uh, we, we, we kicked off saying hey to you, and now you're formally here, so we'll, we'll say hey again. Uh, thank you for your leadership. Uh, uh, your your co-chair on the House Mental Health Caucus, Nap um, Congresswoman Napolitano, gave us some opening remarks. We'd love for you just to hear uh, or for you to share just a few uh, words with the group on uh, your priorities and where you think we need to go for mental health as a nation. And thank you again for your support and for being here. Yeah, sure. Sorry for the informality. And sorry, I, I just got back from a, an eye appointment and it was supposed to be a half hour and it was an hour and 45 minutes. So <laughs> that's how it goes. But uh, I apologize for that uh, being delayed. But, uh, you know, a day doesn't go by where I don't think about my niece uh, who committed suicide on April 24th of 2012. And uh, it profoundly affected me in ways I can't even describe. And I was, I was waiting to talk just now. I was thinking of her again and thinking of that day because I had to identify her because uh, her parents were out of town and um, it profoundly affected me. And so I'm always hit my radar up for um, uh, situations uh, involving mental health in general and suicide in particular. And I just got a call from a very good close friend of mine who is head of a local university here in Syracuse area, who's had uh, an outbreak of suicides on campus. And um, she's devastated. She doesn't know what to do. Um, she is, uh, um, uh, she is uh, scrambling 
And I started telling her some basic things. I'm like, uh, did you uh, did you know that suicide is what, what, what a leading cause of deaths for kids 10 to 24 years old? And she's like, no. I go, did you know that suicide is the number 10 cause of death for all Americans? And she said, no. And I told her how much a rise suicides were and mental health issues were amongst uh, adolescents, especially now with COVID and all the crisis. And this woman is incredibly, she's a brilliant person. She's head of a university or, or a college in central New York, a well-known college of Lemoyne. And uh, she didn't know any of this. And I'm like, that that's the problem. If we don't find a way to break through the narrative about what a devastating effect that mental health has in, in general and suicide in particular on our society. I don't know what, what we could do. And I finally noted for her that um, uh, I think a lot of the rash of overdoses, especially her and overdoses are self-medication for uh, mental health issues. So to me, it's a big, um, uh, it, it, it's, it, there's not a bigger issue out there. Um, I was very heartened to see during the pandemic the uh, that telehealth has come of age with mental health, at least in, in some respects. And I pushed hard uh, to have telehealth counseling for, for uh, be, to be covered by Medicare because they weren't going to cover it. And we pushed hard during a pandemic. And not only are they covering it, it looks like they're going to cover it permanently now going forward. At, at least that sounds like what's going to happen. So that's really good. And I'm very, you know, anytime I can do anything to help, like the suicide prevention hotlines and things like that and getting more funding for them, I've, I've got that. And I do a lot of that. Uh, um, work and uh, I just want to be an advocate. And it's, sometimes it's frustrating when how little people know about this disease and it is a disease and how it's treated so much differently than anything else. And uh, that's part of the reason why I think people aren't going into the field like they should. It's um, not talked about enough. And uh, you know, if, you don't, if, if we don't start getting to the point where we can talk about mental health in the same way we talk about a bad knee or a bad arm or a bad leg, and just normalize the fact that that's just another ailment. It's not some uh, something that's you know outside of main health. It's part of health, and um, we've got to figure out ways to attack it. So I always make time for events like these and and, and opportunities to talk because I want to uh, let you know that we're working hard. I'm gonna you know with uh, Grace Napolitano, she uh, we're, we co-chair the Mental Health Caucus, and I'm chair of the Suicide Prevention Task Force, and. Uh, um, we are obviously not breaking through yet. We got to keep doing that. My goal is to have as much funding for uh, mental health research with the National Institutes of Health that they get for everything else, including cancer. Um, it's one of the leading causes of death in this country, and no one treats it as such. And we've got to be able to talk about mental health just like we talk about anything else, and we got to be able to fund it. And that's just the way it should be. So anything I can do to help going forward, I will. Um, uh, and I just, uh, I'm committed as long as I'm in Congress and as long as I, I'm breathing air in this earth, I'm going to, I'm going to be a champion of this issue because for me, it's, uh, um, I've seen it firsthand and I see it all around me and, uh, it's, it's just devastating. And, and if you look at, uh, lack of productivity and, la and healthcare costs, I mean, if we help uh, really make inroads into mental health and, and find, find some of the root causes of it. Imagine what the impact of society would be just from an economic standpoint. So um, I think we got to keep pushing and I com commend all of you in this field. Uh, you're in a, and it's a very difficult field, but I commend you for it. And uh, anything I can do to help going forward, just know that you'll always have a voice with me. I promise you that. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. Thank you, Congressman. Thanks for your leadership. Thanks for your courage showing up here today, sharing a little bit about your personal story as well as where you're pushing for change in Congress. It means a whole lot. And as we often say, language changes culture and the importance of using language like you just used to normalize the conversation around mental health is what should inspire all of us. So we appreciate you joining us today and uh, thank you for your ongoing commitment to this issue. Okay, God bless. And please just don't wait for us to ask, uh, reach out to us and tell me what we need to do. And I'll, I'll, I'll be as loud as I can. I can be a real pain in the ass in Washington. So I'll do that for you guys anytime. Okay. Thank you very much. We appreciate right. you. God uh, bless folks. Take care. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Wonderful. Uh, nothing like a little shot of adrenaline there. Thank you, uh, Congressman Katko, for coming on. Um, so to go back to where we were and, and just to kind of get back into the importance of the action elements, uh, Patrick, I actually want to come back to you for a second, because at the top, I described how you were behind this groundbreaking Mental Health Parity and Addiction Ac Equity Act while you were in Congress, and you've continued to be a champion for those impacted by mental health and substance use orders. 
Given this unique perspective and all the lessons that you've learned there, what remains to be done regarding mental health, particularly if you can, in the context of COVID-19? Thanks, uh, Ben. Well, uh, as uh, Congressman Katko said, I mean, the suicide amongst our young people ages 10 to 24 increased over 60% between 07 and, and 2018. And by comparison, we've made incredible strides in reducing the long-term survival rate of leukemia. Uh, you know, now it's uh, near 90%. In heart disease, we've actually decreased death rates 4% a year between 2000 and 2010. The reason I make those analogies, Ben, is that in spite of the fact that we passed the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act, which was to try to guarantee equal treatment, and that meant equal reimbursement, because this is all talk. If the dollars are not there to ensure that these illnesses are given the same priority as other illnesses, then all this is is talk. And I really believe that uh, we need to embed parity in and all of our solutions to respond to these illnesses in our reimbursement system. I love that the Congress just passed increases to discretionary dollars, particularly through SAMHSA. That's terrific, but we don't fight cancer with block grants. We don't fight heart disease with block grants. And I still think people are under the mistaken belief that because it's great that we've modestly increased uh, these discretionary dollars that somehow we're tackling the problem. That's not going to do it. We have to be comprehensive in our approach. So, uh, you know, as I said, parity is big, but also CMS, which is the biggest um, payer in the country, it guides all other payers, really needs to show us the way in terms of new financing opportunities to uh, really not only pay equal, because I think our goal now is pay what mental health is going to return. If you want to see value, as Congressman Kako just said, pay for mental health and you'll see value all throughout the healthcare system. And uh, with that, payers are, are doing more on their own to increase collaborative care code uh, reimbursement. But that was really led by CMS and we need CMS to continue uh, to do things uh, like that. Um, but finally, let me just say, you know, the, the insurance oversight is going to be important. And I'm happy to say that states have taken this on and set examples for other states across the country, because many of these states are the front lines of insurance regulation. And uh, California just enacted landmark legislation, as you know, 855. And uh, that's being replicated around the country. Illinois passed um, coordinated specialty care for schizophrenia. It's still amazing in this country that we wait for people to have multiple breaks before we ever intervene in the way that best reduces the chance of uh, reoccurrence and relapse. Um, and of course, with uh, addiction, as our friend Paul Gianfredo uh, says, uh, before stage four, I mean, when are we going to start to screen universally for mental health and addiction. And I love what uh, Congresswoman Napolitano said about the students because ultimately we have to go upstream. And I know our biggest, some of our biggest priorities are prevention and early intervention. It just has to be then because there's no way in the out years we, we'll be able to sustain the growth in the incidence and prevalence of mental illness and addiction if we do not stem it uh, from where it begins. And that is uh, with kids where 75% of uh, these illnesses uh, have incidents before age uh, 24 years of age. This is really, a, um, these are illnesses that affect our young. We need to be where our young are and that's our schools. And thankfully the COVID education response gives us a chance to bridge some dollars to meet kids' mental health needs in the schools. But to my earlier point, those aren't sustainable dollars. They're grant dollars. What we need in the next few years is to bring automatic reimbursement for school-based mental health through the telemental health that, doc, uh, that Representative Katko just mentioned. That would be a big uh, start in addition to doing the social emotional learning and all of the other kinds of things that are gonna be uh, sustaining to our kids as they face very stressful times in their own lives.
Thanks, Patrick. And a lot of the science and the evidence that you just cited um, in part has been done by many of our friends over at NIMH. And so Dr. Gordon, coming over to you, I, I'm sure it was music to your ears to hear the representative describe the importance of putting more dollars into NIH for studying mental health. And you lead the federal agency researching mental disorders and suicide prevention. Uh, what research can you talk to us about that speaks to the importance of mental health to our nation's recovery from COVID-19? Well, there's, there's two sets of, of data that we have to rely on. One is information that we've learned from past disasters, traumas, epidemics, and what we're learning now from what's going on during COVID. So let's start with what we know from the past. What we know from the past is that a significant portion of individuals exposed to a disaster or a mass trauma or an epidemic will experience immediate and intense reactions. Um, what about COVID? Are we seeing that? Absolutely. We're seeing the rates of what we call self-reports of symptoms. So you, you do a phone survey or a web survey uh, and you ask, you know, are you, have you felt depressed, depressed in the last two weeks, anxious, uh, trouble sleeping, suicidal thoughts, doubling in the rates by which Americans are endorsing those symptoms. So as many as 40% of Americans are endorsing one or more of these significant mental health symptoms. So as you might expect, we're uh, after a trauma, many, many people are affected mentally and uh, that's happening during COVID. What do we know about what to expect then over the next you know, several months as we hope to emerge from this pandemic? Well, in the settings of traumas and epidemics in the past, most of those people will recover. Most of them will recover on their own, but a significant fraction of those individuals who are suffering now will continue to suffer uh, despite the resolution of the trauma. Um, and even those who will recover, many of them will need help to recover they'll need the aid of a mental health professional. What can we do to speed recovery? Again, what do we know from past disasters? We know that uh, the people at risk are the people most impacted by the trauma. Uh, so in terms of COVID, the people who live in communities that are more se severely affected are going to be most at risk of mental health impacts. And we're seeing that in the data too. If you look at African-Americans and Hispanics, Native Americans, the surveys that we're seeing suggest higher rates of reporting these symptoms. Um, if you look at suicide deaths, well, the, while we don't see yet an increase in suicide deaths as of last June, that's the earliest data we have available across the US, we're seeing in pockets, particularly in African-American communities, increase in deaths by suicide. So we're seeing impacts on more severely affected communities. How can we help those communities? The most important thing is to meet people's immediate and basic needs, make sure they're safe from the trauma, in this case, from the virus, get them vaccinated, give them medical care, food, water, shelter. These are really important. What else do you need to do? You need to provide other kinds of support, social supports. You need to make sure that communities have means of getting together and helping each other. And for the most part, we've been doing that pretty well through this pandemic, the social support piece. And more or less, we're trying at least on the financial support piece. So we're doing what we can, and that is hopefully helping mitigate. But finally, we really need to address the ability to provide mental health care for those who need it. And there's two classes, the ones most severely affected by the pandemic who were not previously suffering from mental illness, and also those suffering from mental illness already, and particularly those with serious mental illness. Those with serious mental illness are more than twice as likely to contract the virus. They're more than three times as likely to die from COVID-19 just because they have schizophrenia or other serious mental illnesses. So we need to make sure that we treat those with mental illnesses, that we treat those who are severely affected, and we need to be able to provide opportunities for them to seek and access that care. Uh, finally, I would also mention, uh, I appreciate the support of Representative Katko and many others in Congress who support our research endeavors. We are doing what we can with our current budget to support research into the impacts of COVID and importantly, to study what works and what doesn't work as well in the context of the pandemic to mitigate these uh, mental health effects. But we could always use more resources for that purpose. Um, and uh, and uh, we look forward to being able to learn from this pandemic, not only to help people now, but also to help people through the next trauma or the next epidemic that hits the United States. Thank you, Dr. Gordon. And I wanna pick up on something you said and turn to Colleen. Um, 
Uh, as Dr. Gordon just described, there's been different responses to COVID in different communities. It has not been a, a blanket response, and some communities have had a harder time than others. Um, individuals and communities have unique needs. We know this. And when it comes to mental health, we must identify that, that we have to change the systems that serve them. Colleen, what steps do we need to take to ensure equity is enabled within mental health? Thanks, Ben. Yeah, I think to that point, we know that inequities in mental health didn't just start with the pandemic, but they have been exacerbated. And I think, you know, if we don't very intentionally make equity a central part of mental health and suicide prevention going forward, we would expect that the, those inequities will persist. And when we look at communities that have experienced a disproportionate impact from the pandemic, you know, there's a variety of reasons, and it's everything from healthcare inequities around race, ethnicity, geography, sexual orientation, gender identity, um, but also how we are, how we have access to care. And so there's been a lot of great uh, developments around telehealth, but how do we make sure that that access to telehealth is is uh, far reaching and that the digital divide and broadband access issues, for example, don't limit who is able to um, have access to care via some of these new technologies where the red tape has been removed. So really thinking kind of across the board, what are the equity issues in each? And that's something the national response is doing. And uh, one of our priorities, we are very intentionally focused on communities that have been disproportionately impacted, but we also recognize in each of those priorities, there is an equity lens to really looking at crisis services, at looking at access to best practices um, in, in clinical settings, um, across the board, early prevention, early intervention in schools. And so I would, I would just encourage Courage is at, you know, we know we need to improve cultural competence in our care and our programming and address social determinants. And I think this is something that's already come up in the QA. You know, how do we make sure that the role of housing and education and job and financial factors in mental health and suicide is part of our conversation when we are talking about how do we help communities um, recover and, and, and rebuild after um, the, the impacts of, of COVID. Um, but I'd also argue, I think there's also a need to invest in better data collection and research so we can better understand the risk and prevention and treatment um, that would be most effective in underserved communities and at-risk populations. And so that's everything from in making sure our surveys and data collection tools are asking the questions that we need to know the answer to, to be able to make and better informed decisions to guide prevention efforts that would specifically address inequities. And this is, you know, collecting data on fatal and non-fatal suicide events that include demographic information on sexual orientation, on gender identity, on military veteran status, and improve the quality of the data that we do collect on race and occupation and industry. So we have more information that can guide our efforts. And then I, um, along with the research side as well, we need to better understand the nuanced expression of mental health and suicidal behavior in different populations. And this is something that um, emerging research has really indicated is important to better understand and was a recommendation of the Congressional Black Caucus's report on Black youth suicide. And I think it, it's one thing that um, and, and IMH has been moving that uh, recommendation forward. And so to echo, I think a theme that we've already heard a good bit about is that we need to have that better data and that research. And we need our federal agencies to have the resources they need so they can invest in answering those key research questions and helping us better understand how to translate that research into practice that will specifically help us better address inequities and um, support communities that are have been disproportionately impacted by COVID for a number of reasons. So many amazing nuggets of wisdom in there, Colleen, and I wish we could talk about each one of them. I'm going to tee up Dr. Gordon in just a second to come back and talk about prevention, which is a theme that you surfaced. But um, another thing you surfaced is that one of the limiting aspects to accessing care is that people have to work pretty hard to find that care. I've often said that it's one of the cruelest ironies in healthcare that the more diagnoses you have or the more crisis you're in, the harder you have to work to get that help. Um, the fracturing of health and the fragmenting of our system seems to make this harder. So Representative Kennedy, I know that you believe that mental health must be fully integrated into healthcare, which is a theme that is consistent across the national response into all the systems that affect people with mental health and substance use disorders. What do you see as the areas that we should be focusing on right now to push that broader integration that we need? Well, it, you're right. Um, we have a huge demand right now. We need all hands on deck. 
So that means we cannot leave all of our rest of our medical system sitting on their hands because we haven't given them the tools to incorporate mental health into their professions. I mean, think about it. This is a, an illness where we automatically refer it to some other you know, system. We've never integrated in, and we, we need to leverage uh, more knowledge and evidence-based treatment opportunities for the primary care system. We need to support in, in many other respects, a whole lot of additional um, personnel that we have in our system to multi-purpose them to do mental health because it really is a misnomer that any other specialty in medicine you can do without also incorporating mental health. Uh, my late sister had cancer, very traumatic event. Mental health wasn't required as part of her treatment for cancer. I dare say everybody is familiar with the fact that if you have heart disease and you have depression, you're four times more likely to have another heart attack. Why we're not insisting on uh, more training throughout our healthcare system of all healthcare providers, not just those with the purview of mental health as a specialty it is something we need to re-examine. Um, but, but to your point, uh, Ben, I think that's why schools are so important because schools bring the equity piece. It's where all the kids are. If we're going to um, really reach kids and in many cases, their families through innovative programming, the schools are a great place uh, to also leverage. That means we have to train teachers, school bus drivers, custodians. We need to create cultures of, of caring in our schools, uh, bring social emotional learning. As they said, have telehealth now be available to the school kids within the school nurses program or whatever. My, my wife's a public school teacher. Discipline, just like the rest of our uh, justice system is really the only tool that anyone has at their disposal to deal with, quote, behavioral health issues. That has to change. Um, we need a multi-intercept model um, that also educates our police officers, educates everyone in our criminal justice system. In other words, the, the proposals that we've made in this um, uh, series of recommendations apply really to better education reform, better criminal justice reform, in addition to better health care reform, not to mention the fact that, as Colleen said, and, and Dr. Gordon, you need to make sure housing is stable, you know, food isn't scarce, um, that people have what they need in terms of their uh, social determinants of health. Um, so finally, let me just say, um, employers now have an obligation really out of necessity because of the real-time data that we have that uh, any of their employees who are suffering from any of these illnesses really have much marked lower productivity rates and, of course, increase in absenteeism and, quote, unquote, presenteeism. That's when they're there, but their minds are occupied with these uh, worries and anxieties and depressions and addictions. We need to make sure our employers are adequately equipped to revamp their employee assistance programs and to know what to really ask for in, from their third party administrators, their payers, um, their insurance companies who work for them. So, um, you know, Ben, you're really saying, what's a holistic model look like? And you can't uh, stem this tide by just um, thinking that you're gonna do it in little pieces. It's gotta be comprehensive and I'm happy that our report uh, therefore addresses this in a much more comprehensive way. Thank you, Patrick. That's uh, again, a lot of things in there, but I'm gonna come back to you in just a second because you did highlight the importance of schools and our youth. And I wanna come back to you and talk about that in just a second. But before we do, I, I promised uh, Dr. Gordon, I was gonna come back to you on prevention because that is this um, almost consistent theme throughout our discussions today. Even um, Representative Katko, when he was describing some of the issues that he's seeing right now in New York around suicide, we know that suicide is, is preventable. We know there's a lot of things that we can do on the prevention side that we simply haven't invested adequately in. So uh, because we know that prevention and early intervention are key to addressing suicide and mental health problems, and there must be more long-term investments in these areas, what has COVID revealed about what prevention efforts and services are needed to be more accessible during and outside of disasters? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question and thanks for the opportunity to respond to it. So let's focus for a moment anyway on suicide prevention in particular. 
you know, our research has shown that one of the most important things you can do to prevent a suicide is to identify those at risk. And we have several ways of doing that, uh, including some sophisticated AI based, you know, algorithms, but the most basic and most important one is to ask. Universal for screening for suicide, particularly in healthcare settings, particularly in emergency rooms, is a well, well known, very effective tool. It's cost effective, and uh, and it can lead with the right interventions to reductions in suicide attempts later on. Uh, does that work in the context of COVID? There's a lot of evidence that suggests it does. Perhaps the best evidence for that is uh, an increase in Texas, uh, where a nice paper was published just recently, an increase in the rates at which individuals are screening positive for suicidal ideation in emergency room visits. So uh, almost a doubling in the rate at which people are, are acknowledging uh, suicidal thoughts when they come to the emergency room in Texas. And it's unlikely that's restricted just in Texas, given the increased rates of suicidal ideation seen in the survey data that I talked about earlier. Why do I say that's good evidence that it works? Because when people acknowledge it, then they can be directed into treatment. And, uh, and if you didn't ask everybody, our data would suggest you're identifying about half as many people you're missing. Uh, at least as many people as you're finding if you don't ask everybody about uh, suicidal ideation. So there's a lot of good evidence that screening for suicidal ideation works and that it should be done universally in all healthcare settings. Um, and I think the data from, from COVID would, would suggest that's the case. And again, I would point to, although, you know, the jury isn't really out yet, but we have nationwide data through last June. We have uh, a couple of states sending data through September that suicide rates are not increasing. And I think we can credit to that, to the fact that a lot of these places are indeed carrying out screening. They are doing suicide prevention efforts. Um, and we're seeing hopefully the effect of all the efforts that we're putting into it, but, the, but, but it's not being done everywhere and it needs to be done, do, needs to be done everywhere. <clears throat> There's another issue about suicide prevention <clears throat> I would just mention is that there are a number of clinical approaches as well as population-based approaches to reducing suicide. One of those is, of course, the zero suicide uh, effort, which is a healthcare system-based effort. Um, but there are also well-known treatments, both pharmacological and uh, psychotherapeutic that reduce suicide risk. And so if we can get people into these training, these programs, and more importantly, if we can get more support to pay for these programs uh, and to make them available, particularly in underserved communities where healthcare access and mental health care access is a challenge, uh, we'll do better. And then I'll throw one more thing in that we need access to this stuff in schools. And with that, maybe I'll turn it back to you because I'm sure uh, others might want to com uh, comment on the school thing. And I, I, not quite yet. I want to go from suicide prevention to general prevention. I would say there we we really um, I think we we really need to work on this. We need to understand how to prevent these effects in the context of the pandemic, particularly in kids, particularly when they're in hybrid learning situations or when they're not in school. And and I would say that's a big gap area. Our research is going to try to address it, um, but uh, but it's a big concern is what's happening to our youth who are not able to be in school right now. Thank you. And, and I actually want to stay with schools. Um, Colleen, I'm going to make you this, put you in this awkward situation where I'm going to go to crisis in just a second and go from, you know, prevention to all the way down the other end of the continuum to crisis. So I'm going to see you up for that, but I want to stay with the youth in schools for just a second and come back to Patrick. But before I do, just one, one comment, um, Dr. Gordon, on what you were saying. You know, there's this um, false belief out there that suicide prevention is just the responsibility of the mental health community. And I think you said this so well, that suicide prevention is all our responsibilities from just us as individuals taking care of loved ones, our friends, our neighbors, all the way up to healthcare systems, you know, universally asking the right questions to assess. And I think that's extremely wise words and gets back to something that Patrick already mentioned around the importance of integration and having us really comprehensively think about integrating mental health into the places that people are, which includes uh, looking at suicide prevention. So Patrick, I wanna come back to you for youth for a second because uh, you know, Dr. Gordon teed it up nicely with the schools and because you already uh, have, have outed your wife and her school teaching prowess here. The pandemic has been particularly devastating for our country's youth. Um, as a parent, your parent, I mean, there's not a parent I don't speak to who isn't worried about how we can help our young people be resilient in the face of the challenges that we've all faced last year. Of course, the trauma from COVID is compounded 
wherever youth have other adverse childhood experiences or ACEs, which is so often the case with our Black, Latinx, LGBTQ, and youth of color. What must we do to help children as they return to school? Well, I think, let me cut right to where we can apply a uh, state response, especially using this uh, additional money that's coming down from the American Recovery Act. States really need to get to Medicaid reimbursement for originating site of service in the schools for telemental health. I've said that a couple of times, but it's because it's not done. It's only done in, a, in the IEP setting. We need a much broader approach and I'm signaling it because if we're gonna do this systemically, we've got to pay for this systemically. Two, we have to keep in mind uh, screen time and distracted parenting. And as a, a father of uh, five children, 13 and under, I can tell you that uh, I can empathize with everyone with the amount of screen time that they worry their kids have. But we have to be much more uh, intentional as a nation about the impact of that. We're getting more and more um, back in terms of data, and that's part of the reason why we stress the importance of getting data. But I don't think you need a whole lot of data for anyone uh, to just say, based upon their gut, that we're going to pay a big price for, you know, the kids are online for education umpteen hours a day with little to no socialization. And then they go on their iPads and play video games and then they have social media. We are we are really setting up the next generation for less resiliency uh, because they don't have those uh, abilities to practice interpersonal skills. And what, what we have to learn from this COVID crisis is that when we go back to in-person, we have to understand the value of in-person. We need to support even more um, in-person and interaction because that's where resiliency takes place. We are social beings. That's how kids mediate, understand, and navigate stresses. Um, I believe we're gonna see a great uh, re reduction in impulse control uh, diagnoses, um, all because of the amount of screen time. And now we're seeing uh, the major um, tech companies advertise more uh, online learning. Uh, but I think the data is gonna show, and this is where it's going to be important for Department of Ed to show as well that there's not going to be greater learning just because everybody's got an iPad in front of them or a, a computer. Uh, the, the data so far, I think, is revealing that kids are not absorbing that information because it's not delivered to them in a way that's healthy. Um, but, uh, you know, back to empowering teachers. I mean, think there, there's no way a child's going to learn if their limbic system, their amygdala is full of those ACEs, as you said, adverse childhood experiences. If the trauma that they've grown up with is unabated and unaddressed, um, that can take root in hardwiring in the developing brain for kids to adapt to the stresses with maladaptive or unhealthy uh, behaviors. And uh, that can really take them offline uh, for, for their lives if, if it's not corrected early. And we have an obligation for our kids to really prepare them for the future. And that will mean that um, not only embedding social emotional learning on the mental health side, but also, as I said, making sure there's mental health treatment for those who do have diagnoses on the other side, uh, all school-based, I think is gonna be the only guarantee to your point, Ben, where we, we address that equity gap in black and brown minority communities, uh, schools as the equalizer, that's where we need to invest in order to make this work. Um, and I'm glad to see that we've addressed this as an important component to our plan. Thank you, Patrick. And you know, just as we have adverse childhood experiences, we also know that trauma and these crises affect communities and adverse community experiences. And so I wanna talk a little bit about the crisis into the continuum for a second, and then we'll begin to wrap up here our session. So Colleen, I want to come to you. Uh, there are continuous heartbreaking stories of families that are trying to get help from a loved one who's having a mental health crisis. Uh, I'm sure like many of my colleagues on the phone, at least weekly, I get a text or a phone call from a friend who, because they saw me on a webinar, because they know what I do for a living, they think that I can add, actually help them in ways um, that other, the system cannot. And it's challenging. And so one of the de facto default responses is calling 911 to get help. And some, for many, unfortunately, sometimes that result ends in tragedy. 
The FCC and Congress acted last year to put in place a new three-digit number, 988, to serve as a National Suicide Prevention and Mental Health Crisis Hotline. And this is going to be by July 2022. Every phone in the U.S. will be connected to this hotline when the caller dials 988. Could you? I know we're going to talk about this um, next week for our, our uh, follow-on session, but could you guys go ahead and tell us a little bit about the vision that you have for the 988 system and how it can serve to be an alternative to law enforcement-centered response? Sure. Thanks, Ben. And as you mentioned, you know, it'll be great to dive deeper on this in the next briefing. Um, but really what the dialogue around preparing for 988 implementation has opened up is a national conversation that revisits how we as a country and as communities respond to individuals and country. And it really focuses on moving away from a punitive public safety led response and towards a mental health led response that's grounded in empathy and support and options for those who are in crisis. Um, and priority four of the national response really uh, talks a good bit about this and calls for crisis response services that are in line with the recommendations of both the Action Alliance's Crisis Now report and the SAMHSA national guidelines for behavioral health crisis which you know, very briefly um, call for someone to answer the call, 24 seven call centers in every state, someone to help mobile response teams in every state and some place to go, options along the full continuum of crisis stabilization services. And so while the three digit number is a really important, great first step, I think what we really need now and we'll talk about going forward is the collaboration and investment needed at the federal and state level to ensure that a comprehensive crisis continuum is in place. And so mental health led, compassionate, non-punitive response is the norm and not, and not the exception. Thank you, Colleen. Um, that, it's a great point. And, and for those interested in this topic, we are gonna be able to go deeper. Uh, on April 2nd, between one to two Eastern, we're gonna have an entire session that talks about 988 and the transformation of crisis care. So um, thank you, Colleen, for that. Um, I want to just wrap up with one final question to all three of you, and just being respectful of our time here and the folks that we've got who probably have another meeting on Zoom right after this. I'd love to, if you all had one thing that you could tell members of Congress and their staff about mental health and addiction during this unprecedented moment in our history, what would that one thing be? What do you want people to hear from you today that maybe they could walk away and say, okay, that's the one thing I need to be thinking about when I consider policy or programs or funding for mental health? Um, Colleen, I'll, I'll start with you. No, no pressure here. Sure. I think, you know, the one thing I would reiterate is that the mental health impacts of the pandemic you know, don't go away when the shots go in the arms um, and that the priorities that are laid out in the action plan, again, um, are, are a long term response to really make sure that we have the systems, the prevention, the treatment and the financing to support mental health. And, and suicide prevention going forward. And I just, you know, as we've talked about a, a bit is that the pandemic has not impacted all communities the same and we really need to be intentional. Um, while we don't have data that suicide has been increasing nationally during the pandemic, at this point we do have indication from states that some communities, um, particularly black American communities and others have reported increasing rates. And so we need to continue to collect the data and respond um, and make sure that whether it's making sure the schools that are the least resourced have access to the resources in the American Rescue Plan um, and whatnot, that really the response um, comes is through an equity lens of those uh, communities and individuals that need it most. Beautifully said, thank you, Colleen. Uh, Dr. Gordon, your thoughts. So I, I would, I, uh, Colleen stole my thunder on the second point, but I'll, I'll broaden that out to say that we need to think about a mental health response that is uh, geared towards the level of uh, the level of impact. And so, uh, yes, we need to think about it on a community level and we need to make sure the most impacted communities get the most resources. We also need to think about it on an individual level in terms of, you know, uh, for what, what, what I need to do for my grandmother might be very different from what I need to do for uh, a relative who might be significantly affected by mental illness. Uh, and uh, it might be, uh, again, yet a level less than what's needed to help uh, someone severe, with severe mental illness recovering from COVID uh, who is homeless. So we need to think about uh, putting resources to help those who need it most. Thank you for that. And uh, Patrick, you want to close this out here? Yeah, thanks, Ben. Uh, well, I want to thank Wellbeing Trust, too. Uh, we at the Kennedy Forum worked with you to try to develop a more of a toolkit for advocacy, because we're not going to be able to solve this if we don't curate all of these policies that are proposed here and in other documents across the congressional 
um, calendar in every single committee in Congress can do something to advance this crisis. And uh, as Frederick Douglass said, a power will concede nothing without demand. Never has, never will. So it's going to demand of us to demand of Congress, to demand of state legislators, governors, and other um, authorities to respond to this, to, to employers, to payers, to schools. We need a much more active mental health movement um, to get the resources that Dr. Gordon needs, to get the resources at the state and local level that they need. Um, so I uh, think that this is not just a plan for treating mental health, um, but it's also to treat mental illness. We can see this as a comprehensive approach. Um, and I think that there's enough room for everybody to be part of this great agenda and invite people to be part of it with us. Thank you so much. You're here. Well, thank you, uh, Colleen, Josh, Patrick. Thank you for your leadership on mental health. Thank you for your words of wisdom today. Uh, this has been extremely wonderful. Uh, thank you all for watching and for joining us. Uh, just as a reminder, we are going to be doing these each week for the next four weeks beyond today. Uh, next week's session is going to be on crisis, followed quickly on how we can integrate care, a theme that we really brought up uh, routinely and consistently there. We're going to talk about workforce, and we're going to get back into the crisis and the prevention angle, which I think all of my colleagues here described so beautifully today. So we'll close this out. A big thanks to Alicia Diaz from Inseparable for helping organize us and, and make this run, uh, this ship run right. Uh, we thank you and uh, wish you all to be well and have a great rest of your day.